thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Perry Bacon. I'm one of the fellows here at New America. And we're launching this uh, series of, uh, uh, there'll be some discussions and also some pieces as well. And the, the idea is that from, from moment to movement and to look at criminal justice and racial inequality after 2014 and some of the, what happened in Ferguson and other things as well. So we want to get into a, we're going to have a broader discussion about that today and also throughout the year. So I'll introduce our panelists who are here today. We've got an excellent panel of people who really study the issues really well, and I hope we'll come up, come away from some learning from this and uh, broaden out our perspectives as well. And we'll have, some, we'll have about a half an hour for questions at the end after, we, after the panel speaks as well. So I'll start uh, beside me. Terry Adams is a professor, uh, associate professor of Administration of Justice in Howard University's Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Her research takes a multidisciplinary approach to examining issues that have both theoretical and practical implications. Her civic interests include emergency management, policing, violence against women, and the impact of trauma and disasters on individuals and organizations. We have next Rashad Robinson, who is the executive director of The Color of Change, the nation's largest online civil rights organization. Um, and then beside him, we have Monica Potts. She is a New America fellow who's writing a book about the post-prison lives of several men after they returned to West Baltimore and exploring the idea of a second chance recovery. Uh, Monica was before a, an editor at the American Prospect covering poverty and economic opportunity in the U.S. And then finally at the end, we have uh, Scott Roberts, who is the senior ca campaign manager at the Advancement Project. Before joining the Advancement Project um, in 2011, he worked as an organizer and strategist on electoral and issue campaigns, including the 2008 Obama campaign and other campaigns for workers' rights, health care, marriage equality, and immigrant rights. So welcome to our panel, and welcome for, to you all as well. And so where I wanted to start, just as an opening, um, would be what I want to ask you all is, did we learn anything in 2014 about race or criminal justice, or did the media start covering things that we kind of all broadly knew about? I'll start with you, Scott. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about these important issues uh, with this panel. I think, um, you know, it depends on who the we is that learned. You know, I think probably the folks on this yes. panel didn't learn too much about race policing, but I think the larger public did. And I would, I would really say that it's been a slow build um, in consciousness around the, especially the criminalization of people of color and especially young people of color. I think, you know, we can go back to as far as, you know, events like Jenna Six, um, but especially more recently around uh, the Trayvon Martin killing, uh, um, uh, Jordan Davis. Uh, we, we've kind of seen this kind of slow build of folks paying closer attention to um, kind of vigilante and state violence against uh, people of color, especially black folks. Um, and you know, you've seen over that time, um, more folks plugging in, more things being shared. Social media, I think, has played a huge role, obviously, getting the word out. Um, and then when, um, um, when the Mike Brown killing happened and, and the Eric Garner killing happened especially, um, we just see that kind of really blowing up. And I think a lot of that is from, unfortunately, it's a really sad state of affairs, but it's, it's too much practice that um, our communities have had in telling these stories, um, and I think we're now at the point where we're we're able to um, to articulate and tell the, the narrative of what's happening in our communities in a more powerful way. And so, with each event, um, more folks are paying attention, and the word is getting out. I think, yeah, I, I agree, and I think that um, what's different, in addition to. Um, the narrative being clearer is that there also is just more evidence. More people have video camera capabilities on their cell phones. And so you're just seeing a lot of things. You know, uh, these, I think some of the events of police brutality are no surprise to communities of color in the cities, perhaps, but actually seeing the way that police act in communities may be a surprise to people, you know, especially white middle class Americans who live in the suburbs and may have never seen the way that um, officers act in those situations before. Yeah, I actually have to agree with what, what both of my pan co-panelists have said. And I think a lot of that has to, has to do with not just sort of the changing fact that we all have cell phones, but that um, you know, the sort of current platforms of the time allow for um, a, a changing way in which we can share information. So for instance, 23 years ago, when the videotape of Rodney King being beaten on the LA highway um, surfaced, 
it actually took days for it to surface. Someone had to videotape it, then they had to make a decision about what they were gonna do with that video. Then they, had, they sent it to CNN, then the folks at CNN had to sit around a newsroom and decide whether or not it was authentic, whether or not they were gonna contact LAPD beforehand. They went back and forth um, around this. And so for years, it's not just that white middle class um, America has had to, um, white middle class America may, may or may oh, not, on. So white middle class America hasn't seen um, these videos um, happening. It's that in order for these, this information to surface, it had to be um, validated by corporate media. And so the stories had to be validated and had to be said that this was true, this actually happened. What we now have is that everyday people have the ability to amplify and share their own stories, whether that's through like you know, Twitter, whether that's through, um, um, whether that's through you know, online platforms. And that sort of changing way has moved us into this age of, com from communications and engagement to the age of participation. And that has changed the way we organize in general. It's changed the way that people see themselves as their own third party validators, their own leaders. We're more likely to trust someone sometimes on our Facebook page and the information they share than we are the talking head on any television network. My feelings uh, are hurt. Sometimes mine are too. <laughs> and, um, and I say that, and I say that, and I say that to say that the idea of who's a, a leader, who's um, an expert, who's a validator on these issues, those old rules are blowing up. And so in terms of what's changing in this sort of current state, that has led to this sort of cultural presence we have around this issue, where we have a heightened awareness that this is happening. Now, just because people know about it does not mean we have the cultural power to change anything. So as much as things have changed, there's also a way in which many things are still the same. Terry. Uh, I would echo what the others have said, but I would also add that um, I think what it, Ferguson has highlighted and other demonstrations around the country is the level of frustration people feel. So that this is nothing new. Um, there are incidents similar to um, the Ferguson incident, um, as well as the incident in New York. It's, again, it's nothing new. This has been going on throughout time but people are more and more frustrated about it. And so here you have a generation of folks that people have basically have said, you know, these kids are really just into social media. They're not really paying attention to political problems. Um, but yet they're in, out in the streets protesting. So I think it demonstrates a reemergence of activism. Um, and it kind of forces us as a society to really look at these issues that communities of color have been dealing with. Um, as Scott mentioned earlier, you know, this is nothing new. To follow up on that, let's define what exactly, do you, in your view, is the problem? Is the problem that police officers are behaving badly? Is the problem that blacks and Hispanics and the police are not getting along? Is the problem something about our laws, where our laws are not set up in the right? Where is the problem about our police practices? What exactly, when we look at last year, how will we define, or is the problem is our society is racist? I mean, what do, how do we define the problem? Maybe two or three of those things can all be at the same, happen at the same time, but what do you think of as the problem we're trying to, the next, you know, the next year should solve? I I'll start with Rochelle. Go, go ahead. Oh, oh, I think there are multiple problems. I guess I didn't come to New America Foundation to talk about solving racism today as much as I, I, can, I can talk about that for a while. I just don't know if we have the time in 90 minutes to actually dig into that. So what I will say is that we have systems of power in this country that have no accountability. And so police officers acting badly are a, a symptom of the fact there's no accountability. That time and time again when police officers sort of misbehave or, or act out of line when it comes to um, black and brown bodies, that there is no accountability, that there's no system of justice when that happens. And that is fueled by a larger culture in society which consistently validates that. Every year out of the top 100 television shows on TV, 20 of them are crime procedures. And every once in a while in one of those law and order shows, you'll see that, oh, it really wasn't the person that, it's, that it was supposed to be, or we were tricked and the black guy was a good guy. But we actually, that's all sort of still validating this idea that, that when the, even when the police officers step out of line, we're, we've watched them for five or six seasons. We understand their backstory. We understand their humanity. We understand their, their problems at home or their problems with alcohol, and they're humanized. And each episode, we have like a guest star, a black and brown character who is either guilty or innocent. And that sort of then fuels a culture where 
a criminal justice system that is unfair, where there's no incentive to go after police officers, political or otherwise. Um, in fact, district attorneys and prosecutors are de-incentivized to going after law enforcement officials because they have to work with them every single day for the majority of their other jobs. And so to the extent that we have a system of power in this country that has no accountability, everything then flows from there. Then it creates no trust in communities. And when you have no trust between communities and law enforcement, you have more problems. And so I do think that when you have a system of justice that at its core is unjust, you end up with all these other problems that you laid out. Anybody else want to follow up? I would also add to that that I think a, it's, it's both the problems with individual officers bringing their biases to their jobs, um, but it's also reflective of the culture of some police departments, such that um, when you think about it, we all bring our past experiences, our world views into every situation that we encounter. Um, but the difference between a person with a badge versus a person without a badge is that the person with the badge has the right to use their weapon and force against you to potentially take your life. So I think it's really important that those individuals are cross-checked uh, regarding how they perceive other individuals. And I say it's also related to the organizational culture because I do believe that some police departments do kind of um, allow this way of viewing others to exist so, so that it doesn't get checked, as you mentioned. Um, and there are some police departments that are actively engaging in looking at these issues and trying to address um, the biases that they see with, among their officers. Um, and, and we can talk about that a little later on, that, but yeah. um, I, I think it's both the individual officers as well as the culture of the police departments. I agree with all of that, and I would just like to add that it's actually very difficult for communities to seek um, uh, justice for this after it happens. So it's very actually hard to bring a lawsuit and say, um, <clears throat> these laws are unfair because they disproportionately affect communities of color, and d communities of color are disproportionately policed. You can't really do that inside our criminal justice system for all different kinds of reasons. And it's probably getting harder to prove disparate impact because the Supreme Court has signaled that it doesn't like to find laws have a disparate impact on communities of color. So I think it's also very hard for communities to come together and actually seek redress for the ways that they're dis unfairly policed. Yeah, and, I, and I, there's there's the there's the accountability of um, disciplining and even criminally punishing officers who are the, the bad officers. But I think there's also this the accountability that the the systems or the departments have to have. Right? How do how does the community take more control, exercise more power in this relationship with the police? It's not about trust to me. It's really about power and who is answering to whom. And um, so I think you know when you see a lot of communities fighting for things like. Um, civilian review boards, that's what they're trying to exercise, is that some kind of um, community authority over police. And I, but unfortunately, a lot of that is also reactive to things that are going to happen to us. And I think what we really need to do is, is, um, is some of the things that Rashad is just talking about. How do we set up a system where police are more accountable to communities? I think we've seen some really you know, scary stuff in New York where the police don't even feel like they are accountable to the mayor. You know, if, if the mayor is not in charge of the police force, you know, who is? Um, and I think, you know, it just in terms of the, the other thing that's driving this, I think we have to look at policing as a part of this larger system of mass incarceration that we have in the United States. When we're incarcerating folks at higher rates than any, any other country, you know, we have to take a deep look at um, what, how policing and the, a lot of the bad practices we see in policing are driven by that. When we're trying to fill, um, well, let me say this, police, you know, the prison industrial complex has become a billion dollar industry. Uh, private prisons are um, booming, and they have bed guarantee contracts with states where they, states have to um, fill up the prisons. And so there's, um, and you know, this maintains a kind of racial caste system, so blacks are targeted, um, other people of color are targeted. Um, it leads to the higher you know, levels of contacts that we see with police, which often lead to these violent occurrences, but they also lead to you know, the, the, the more insidious impacts that police are having in our communities by um, criminalizing um, folks, taking people out of our communities, um, uh, punishing people for things like addiction, uh, smaller level offenses. So um, I think we have to, you know, put it in the in the context of that whole system and really think about how some of these other factors are driving some of the police practices. Sure. Just to follow up on what uh, Scott right, right just right. said, um, 
the police are basically the gatekeepers for the criminal justice system. So if they are operating with biases that are kind of um, forcing them in a way or, or giving them the predisposition to focus on some versus others, then you're going to see more black and brown people um, in the criminal justice system. And if you look at self-report surveys where people actually are asked to report whether or not they have been engaged in criminal activity, there's very little differences between what, let's say, black juveniles report versus white juveniles. But if you look at arrest and incarceration statistics, you, you, you see a flip of that, right? Have so it's not necessarily about the numbers, it's more about the numbers of folks who are actually committing crimes. It's more about who's getting arrested, who's being targeted. Yeah, and I, I think that that's true, and I, want, and, I, and I absolutely believe that there's this, that, like we have no national standard around bias in this country. So like police, or police departments local level are funded by the federal government, and they all have to say that they do anti-bias training, but then there's no national standard. So Kalamazoo says they do anti-bias training, Birmingham says they do anti-bias training, LA, and they have to just say that they did it, and there's no sort of, sort of there's, no, there's no check. But beyond the, beyond the question of sort of the individual, it's not just about the individual bias. There's actually a larger incentive to the way that black and brown communities are policed. The first question that local law enforcement officials have to answer on the form for, to get federal funds is, did you increase drug arrest? Not, did you need to increase drug arrest? Not, um, then, then there's no follow-up around, where did you increase drug arrests from? There's no disaggregation of data. There's no comparison. So they simply have to continue to increase drug arrests. So beyond the individual bias, beyond whether or not like, I have individual bias for one community or the other, if I have to increase drug arrests in a community, I'm going to go to the communities that are going to have the least amount of power to push back on my policing. If I'm in New York, I'm going to go to Brownsville. I'm going to go to the Bronx. I'm not going to go to the Upper East Side and increase drug arrests there. Because at the end of the day, they've got it. they're trying to increase their federal funding. And so yes, absolutely, on an individual level. But on a larger systemic level, bad policing is incentivized by our federal government just through how federal funds flow into local police departments. And that is something that actually can be fixed by our Justice Department. And that's sort of part of the larger national demands that you know many of the organizations that have been working on the ground in Staten Island and Ferguson and other places have been pushing. We're going to come government back to that as well. I want to come yeah. back to that. I just want to quickly add that sure. the NYPD wanted to go to the Upper West Side and increase arrests for drugs. It totally could, because it's not as though drug use is not also there. right? And so I think that's part of the larger point that people have been experiencing is that there are, there are communities that are just untouched by some of these unfair police practices. I'm not a police expert, and I suspect most of the people in the audience are not either. But there are two ideas that I've read a lot about. One is the idea of broken windows policing, and the other is the idea of community policing. Monica wrote a good piece about this. Can you talk about those ideas and maybe if they should be changed in some way? Um, yeah, I mean, so my experience actually with this was that I used to work for the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City before I was a journalist. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the idea of community policing because the CCRB in New York is actually relatively powerful, especially compared to a lot of other cities. And one of the things I saw there was that there are a lot of very minor crimes over which officers have discretion. And so they are tasked with going into communities that are largely poor and largely black and Latino and making more arrests for very, very, very minor crimes. And the idea behind that is that that will prevent larger arrests down the road. That's the broken windows, That's theory. The broken windows theory, that there's a, that if you let um, a level of disorder persist on the streets, then that will sort of create the environment that allows bigger and worse crimes with like murder and robbery with a lot of victims and no one wants murders and murders and robberies to happen and so there's a lot of support for this general idea now it's really debatable whether broken windows um, caused this the decline but what followed after New York City imposed the broken window policing theory was that crime did drop really substantially and so a lot of people credit broken windows with that but 
you know, what's really happening is that you see on the streets that there are just some communities where people are policed very, very heavily for very, very minor crimes. And there are a lot of statutes that are extremely vague. And so if you're standing on the street corner with your friends in a community like Brownsville, you might be stopped by police who tell you to disperse. And um, that's a lawful order. And if you don't follow it, you can be arrested for disorderly conduct. And it's a completely and totally unfair arrest, and it feels unfair to the people being arrested. But you, you don't have the authority to protest your arrest on the street. And so you see a lot of people who come in, and when I was at the Civilian Complaint Review Board, I saw this, a lot of people who come in with a constellation of charges that are just si sort of trumped up. But it's within the officer's discretion, and what they're technically describing breaks the law. So if they come in and they say, oh, you know, these guys were standing on the corner, I t asked them what they were doing, they started causing a scene, other people around them saw them and started to get agitated. I started to arrest them and they resisted arrest and so I arrest them for all of these crimes. Those things are technically crimes and so that officer has not acted badly, he has not committed misconduct. But overall what you see is that the people brought in for those crimes really weren't doing anything wrong, they weren't really disturbing the communities. and they are policed like this constantly. And so it just helps generate a lot of tension. It increases the contact that people in these communities have with police, which means they're more likely to have an incident that where police use force against them. They're more likely to be hurt. They're much more likely to be killed than the communities where these kinds of interactions don't happen at all. And they're more likely to have contact with the criminal justice system, which just really, I cannot exaggerate the extent to which that potentially destroys their futures. You know, if they want to fight that charge, then for the next two years, they're going to be going out of court all the time. They, a lot of people don't do that, and so they plead guilty, so now they have a record. And that just, it really snowballs for the rest of their lives. And so there are just communities in which almost every person between the ages of 13 and 18 comes into contact with police regularly, and that shapes the rest of their lives. Terry, can you talk about the data? What does the data show? Did broken windows work? Is that useful, a useful strategy, and should we think about changing that as an as a American culture? I think in theory, broken windows is a good practice. I mean, it makes sense to clean up on the little things that are happening, fixing the broken windows, making sure that the trash is picked up properly, you know, maintaining the community, that makes sense. But when you get into some of the practices that you talked about, that's when it causes um, people to feel like they are constantly monitored or that the community is actually being attacked. Now, most of the people who live in communities around the country, regardless of what community you're talking about, whether there's crime um, in the community or not, or obvious crimes, let me say, uh, most people are law-abiding citizens. So if you are a law-abiding citizen, you're walking down the street and you just happen to talk to your boys on the corner, but yet p the police are coming up and harassing you, you're gonna ha feel some kind of way about those officers, which then, again, goes against the community policing model. So I'm not really answering your question. Let me ask you a question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of jumping the questions Thank there. You. If you look at the data, the data shows that, as you mentioned, the crime actually did drop, let's say in a city like New York, when they did institute the broken windows um, policies. However, there are some scholars that assert that it was really, has really been about fluctuations in the um, economy than it was about any particular uh, policing practice. Right? So it depends on how you want to look at the data, okay? Um, but kind of getting back to the community policing model, which is something that you mentioned too, that model was supposed to fill the gap between, uh, or, or, or help to heal the tensions between um, the community and the police, such that you would bridge the divide between the two. Now, uh, most police dep departments in major metropolitan areas claim that they are using the community policing model but the model is gonna differ from in, in how it's instituted here in DC, then you see in Baltimore, then you see in LA, and so, so on and so forth. So in the main, I would argue that in many jurisdictions, it is not really being instituted. Now there are some communities like Explain it. Explain what good community policing would look like to me a little bit. Good community policing looks like officers actually getting out and engaging with the community on a daily basis. It looks like officers literally going out and walking the beat um, actually spending time within the communities. So uh, I know in Milwaukee, um, the police chief there has taken on this cause of dealing with the tensions between the community and the, and the police. And he actually has his officers um, walking the beats for at least one hour a day, okay? So that's so, is supposed to, again, facilitate building trust 
as well as relationships. So that if I see you on a daily basis, you might be more inclined to talk to me if something happens in the neighborhood. And if I'm talking to you, you might be more inclined to not feel that I'm um, judging you or that I'm hostile towards you. So it's really, uh, again, building um, trust between the community and the police. Um, but not all police departments actively engage in that. Some might just have a program. You can't really officially um, impact the community by just having one or two programs within the community that you just have a handful of people um, participating in. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah, there's two points. You know, I, I, I absolutely agree in the idea of, of community policing. I, I run a civil rights organization with over a million members who have been active on police reform. But they sometimes need to call the police in their in situations. And they want to be able to trust that when police show up, that, that the police are going to be responsible and they're going to do their job and there's going to be accountability when they don't. The fact of the matter is there's so much federal dollars go into local community policing already. And we can incentivize that type of policing across the board. What we will never be able to do, though, at this point, is to rely on this department or that department to just police themselves. Because that's the situation we have now. To just trust this department over here to implement good policing and that department over here. Because in some situations, you probably will have some departments that will try and do a good job. But those are probably the departments that we didn't have the big problems with to begin with. Um, on, this, on this other issue of broken windows and sort of the, the sister or cousin to broken windows, is this, um, you know, is, this, is, is this other piece around how local and small jurisdictions around the country, and even big jurisdictions like New York City to an extent, um, close budget gaps through broken windows type policing. So in a place like Ferguson, for example, over 25% of the city's budget was on these small infractions like traffic tickets and, and parking tickets. And it was a tax on the poor over and over again. When the police, um, when the police went on their sort of slowdown in New York City, where I live, you know, the, uh, so many of the stories um, in the newspaper were about the, the millions of dollars a week that the city was losing because the, the city wasn't giving out tickets. Crime was going down. They weren't giving out tickets. But, this, but now folks are worried that we're not going to be able to, um, because the tax on the poor, because these tickets were largely being given to poor people, that the city, wasn't, the city was having budget shortfalls. So these, the, the, the issues um, that bubble up when community can't trust law enforcement don't just, just, just don't exist around issues of sort of like, you know, issues of, of, of violence or issues where um, people are being arrested. It, it is um, this sort of over-policing the kind of control of black and brown communities that exist from the state and, and the way in which it impacts people every place from the courthouse to their bank. Let me follow up on this. Monica wrote about this a little bit too, and I think this, in some, view, in some ways, this New York police slowdown was, you all probably didn't agree with why they're, the, why they, how they approached it, but the actual result was not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Is that kind of where you, where you, where you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> I, We're kind of stumbled into something you might broadly agree with. Go ahead. Yeah, and I also just want to follow up on this. Yeah, the, actually, um, arrests, all arrests went down 66%. And as far as I know, the city did not stop functioning. And there weren't people who were victims of crimes no being unavenged. Chaos. There was no mass chaos. And so, and they said, what they had said was that they were arresting people only when they had to, which seems <laughs> like what they should be doing all of the time. And so, um, you know, what, um, what Matt, Matt Taibbi, the, uh, a writer for Rolling Stone, called them um, was backdoor tax collectors. And that's really what they are. Like, if you look at what the broken windows theory was talking about that kind of low-level disorder. You could argue that actually picking up trash and cleaning up graffiti are services that cities should provide anyway. That those maybe aren't city s services that should be dealt with through the criminal justice system. And so what's happened is that cities don't really have much of a tax base, and they haven't for a lot of years. Um, and now that it's growing again, and so really what maybe what cities should do is tax people a little bit more and actually think about a providing city services across the board, including in poor communities that might have a hard harder time um, creating bids or you know, business improvement districts and other things like that, where that, so those services are taken care of privately. Yeah, well, I, on, the, on this question of broken windows, I just feel like from the, starting with the question itself, right, you know, is it working? You know, there's a lot of assumptions there, and I think there, the assumption that we evaluate broken windows by just one metric of whether or not cr reported crime is up or down and don't look at 
the other outcomes that the policy has. You know, getting back to uh, increased contact with the police, arrests, more people being incarcerated. I mean, are those really the outcomes we want from a system to fix one problem, kind of create the next one? Um, in other words, you're saying even if it reduced crime, if there resulted in 20 other problems, this is a bad policy anyway? Okay. Right. And yeah. so the question is, I mean, can we get more creative with how we're dealing with um, issues in our communities? And I think the, what's really interesting to me when I look at some of the local work that's happening around the country are folks who are pushing for alternatives to policing. So you know, work with a, there's a coalition of folks down in North Carolina, the group that, that I work closely with is Spirit House. They are, um, they've had some success in getting um, community peacemakers um, and keepers in roles that police traditionally handle, like trying to resolve conflicts. We've done a lot of this work at Advancement Project on the school to prison pipeline, uh, where we see a lot of youth groups around the country pushing for programs like uh, restorative justice in their schools, where a lot of times young people are leading discipline processes in schools where they're talking and working out what are the real issues underlying conflicts within the, in the, um, within the schools. That the schools are a contained environment, and it, it's easier for I think for us to imagine what alternatives look like in schools. But I wish that we could apply the same type of thinking, rather than saying is, are you know A, B, and C forms of policing better. What are the alternatives to policing um, that we can be pushing forward in our communities, and especially ones that our communities can control to get to this point that Rashad has been making about what is the accountability? We have this institution that's constantly in our communities, the communities of color. Um, at a much higher rate and having more contact with us, we don't have control over it. Um, how can we take away some of the roles that they're playing? You know, how do we, when we talk about this money that's coming in, um, I've been working closely with uh, a group of folks um, involved in groups like Ferguson Action, Black Lives Matter. We've been talking about divestment from policing, not just saying use the money. We, we definitely talk about this too, like using the money to, to restrict what police are doing to, to better regulate them at the federal level, but also how do we take that money away and invest it in communities and things that are gonna help resolve some of these issues. I mean, we know a lot of what's driving um, police contacts, these drug arrests that Rashad is talking about. Like, um, we know there are other alternatives to dealing with, with addiction, um, dealing with the economic conditions that, that you know, um, foster the drug trade in a lot of communities. Um, so you know, I, I think we should be thinking outside of the box. I was gonna ask a question about what are some better police practices you all have seen? You sort of told me one already. Are there other examples of that, police practices that are better at dealing with these, at the police practices that are replacements for what we, what we do now that work well, that you've seen and you think could be modeled in other communities? I think what Scott is talking about is, is having an alternative to the police itself. Police in itself. Um, but, and I, I think that's something that should be on the table. But to, to answer your question, um, I think there are some departments around the, some here and there around the country that are doing some innovative things. Um, I know uh, the police department in Baltimore, Commissioner Batts, is working on um, actually extending the normal practice of, of requiring officers to receive sensitivity training, which has really been heavily critiqued as not really being effective. Mm -hmm to more um, testing them for their personal biases and then uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, training program programs to target those specific biases. So I think that's innovative. The one thing I, I worry about with that question, um, and because there are some places that get held up as models um, from time to time, and then the political dynamic changes in the, that community or that, that, um, that you know, chief who was considered a, um, a, you know, a, a, great, a great leader gets, you know, goes off to the academy or, or gets bumped up to a, a bigger city with a different political dynamic and either can succeed there or not, is that in the process we keep dealing with these like large scale issues in really small ways and not implementing the sort of broad sort of systemic change that we actually need. And we rely on sort of individual interventions to solve what is not sort of like an individualized problem. We actually need large scale interventions at the federal level to, to deal with problems that are not new. Like, yes, we've had a heightened in cultural awareness around what came out, came out in, in Staten Island or Ferguson, but these are not new occurrences. And over and over again, when these issues happen, we go back to the board of like, you hear mayors in the city, we need more training. 
Um, we just, if we had some more money for training, that would be better. If we had some more money for this, that would be better. But at no point are we actually putting in place the type of accountability, the type of sort of mechanisms that actually force people to be fired from their jobs when they, when they step out of line, that, that actually take away resources when police departments don't do what they're supposed to do and, and, and put them under control, that actually in the, the policies of putting tanks into communities when they're having problems instead of putting community policing in when they're having problems with communities. And so to the extent that I agree with all of the, all of the sort of ideas and we've seen places where they work, my biggest fear is that we hold up models that don't stick around because what we don't put in place is the mechanisms that, that force them to have to, to be in place long term. And so they become at the political will or political whim of folks who either are incentivized or de-incentivized to do it based on how the public is voting in any given sort of, you know, electoral cycle. Yeah, can I Go ahead, sure, of course. I, I think what you're pointing to well, to deal with that really would be complicated because policing is local, right? So it's not, we don't have a national police force like some other countries do. So it would be difficult for the federal government to come up with a mandate that then local police departments or local um, mayors would then adapt. Right? But so much of but, the federal but, dollars, right? But you can put in um, provisions such that in order to receive funding from uh, the Department of Justice or from the, um, there's a, actually an Office of Community Policing. Um, you could put in, um, you know, uh, right uh, measures right that say, form, right? right. That where, 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 the, where the clear form where that local departments have to fill out when they get federal dollars, they all fill it out. They're not turning down federal dollars. Um, you know, they, they, you know, they'll turn down Obamacare, then they won't. Um, you know, it, it, they're not going to turn down these dollars, right? So to the extent that we, that we put in place, but I guess what I'm saying is, is that allowing local, local governments from here to there to make different decisions has never benefited black people in America. It is not, like from a civil rights perspective, it has never been something that black folks and communities of color can have, rely on, is to have sort of these individual sort of fiefdoms that decide whether or not there's gonna be fairness or not, and that our rights change, and our ability to be fairly treated and respected change from community to community. So I actually, I completely agree with sort of all of the measures that folks are talking about on the table, I guess my fear is that those measures without sort of the teeth of the federal government, without the sort of dollars forcing them in place, are sort of ideas that we'll never be able to get comfortable with because they are, they are at the whim of folks who find it to be politically incentivized, are politically incentivized at the time to do it. And the minute there, there is an incentive to do something else, our politics tells us in this country that people will do something else. And, and that is essentially the problem, and that is the problem with the fact that all of these policies are not necessarily new. All of these ideas are not necessarily new. The reason why we don't have them is because we have not had the teeth behind them. And in this organizing moment, in this moment where we have people who see this as a cultural present moment where they want to do something about this, building the power to make something be systemic and in place is, I think, the only thing that we can really count on. And, only thing that we can do that's going to allow us to look back at this time 5, 10, 15 years from now and say that we actually made a difference. All right, so Rashad, you're saying it should be at the federal level. So, let, okay, so what are the ideas that, okay, so let's say there's, there's money that the police get from the federal government and we want to attach strings to that. What are the three or four strings you all want to put on that funding? You only get funding from the Department of Justice if you do X, Y, Z. What should X, Y, and Z be? Rashad thought about this, so why don't you go ahead and everybody else can, just three things, what do you want to see? The three things is that we need a usable matrix around force um, nationally. Like we have no, we have no um, usable matrix around how force is treated and as, and as a result, like we don't, we don't, there is not any, and there's not any um, mechanism for accountability for how police officers use force. There is no national database when someone is killed are harmed in police custody right now. And so as a result, we don't actually have a full understanding of the, 
of the, um, of the scope, there has been federal legislation that's passed. Unfortunately, there's no teeth behind the federal legislation. So in fact, while police office, police, local police departments are told they have to report it, there is no um, penalty for not reporting it. So what happens? They don't report it. And then the third thing I would put on the table is that there needs to be in place um, you know, peace officers in all the departments um, across the country. We have about 40 of the 50 departments around the country that have peace officer trainings, that have sort of real in place um, mechanism for reviewing and firing police officers, but there's nothing at the federal level. It's actually sort of the only licensed practice, right? Our doctors in this country, if they step out and do something medically wrong, there's a review board that can decide to take away their license. Lawyers, there's a way to take away their license. Teachers, there's a way to take their, away their license. Police officers, there is no sort of standard for sort of how do you get fired a police officer. And so from state to state, city to city, there's different ways in which that is done, all while our federal dollars are flowing into these departments at really a large scale. So those are three things that I would put on the table. There are many more, but you said three. Scott. Great. Um, three is limiting, I agree. But yeah, they were three. sure I took all the good ones. Um, the, <laughs> I mean, I would second the, the data piece, uh, especially I think the data not only um, tells the story nationally, but allows local communities to better, um, you know, um, campaign for changes that, that they want to see to better have an analysis of how their police departments are operating. We've seen that returning again to the example school defense pipeline as we've been able to get better data from the federal government around school discipline issues like suspensions, arrests, expulsions. Local communities have been able to use that to get change at the local level as well. Um, the training pieces I think are crucial. You know, one of the um, training and also this kind of standard around the use of force. Um, that we can get departments on the same page on, on these things. I think it would be a crucial. I think just one story that stands out to me is what's happening in Ohio right now. There's a couple cases in Ohio. The um, case of John Crawford, who was the young man who was uh, gunned down by police in a Walmart uh, because he had one of the toy guns that was for sale in a Walmart. And then there's the case of Tamir Rice, um, who was a um, 12-year-old boy uh, sh shot in Cleveland uh, by police, again, having a toy gun in a park. And both instances, you saw police respond in a very aggressive um, kind of SWAT style. Um, and what we found out about the officers in the John Crawford case, they had just been through um, tr training on kind of um, active shooter situations. And the training had been very uh, provocative to get you to basically go into Rambo mode, run into the situation, take down the person, whatever. So I think, you know, the, one of the things that folks are calling for there is, is, is training. And I think if, the, if we can use kind of the incentive of federal funding to get folks on the same pages around, you know, um, training, data collection, it will be crucial. I, you know, I would say that the, one of the issues with the federal, um, this federal strategy is also, also very subject to the whims. There's a lot of, um, yeah. I'll come back to that. But yes. there, there's, there's a lot that can be done at the administrative level, which then, of course, like, you know, we don't know how many air holders are going to be in office in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to come back to that whole yeah. issue of when Jeb, if Jeb Bush is president, how are you going to oh, move wow. the issues differently? So we'll come back to that. But go ahead. Yeah. Three, th three, three ideas about three things you'd like to see, Monica or Terry. Um, well, I just want to echo what everybody else said, but also say um, scaling back the drug war in whatever way possible. Um, there is actually, I think, a pretty big appetite for that. There are state budgets that are ballooning with prison costs, and it's a large number of people who are in jail for minor, minor drug offenses. They're drug, they're drug addicts, and they're not necessarily drug, you know, um, drug kingpins, which I think you know was the popular idea in people's minds for a long time. So I think that um, I think that there's actually conservative and, and liberal consensus around the idea that we need to actually reduce the number of people in prison related to drugs. And so I think that's some, one of the things that's within political reach pretty quick, you know, pretty reasonably. And the federal funds, that you, what if you, the police departments get federal funds, what are things they should do to get the federal funds? Um, I would just add two, two other things. I think um, that it's really important to uh, re-examine the psychological testing that officers are supposed to undergo before they are even accepted on the force. Mm -hmm. I think uh, most police chiefs don't have any idea um, what metrics are actually being used by the psychologists that they hire to do that type of testing. Um, I think the other thing would be to really focus on uh, monitoring. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, the concept is called, but it's like er uh, instituting early warning systems. So some departments have this 
where you look at the complaints that are actually coming in from citizens, really evaluating um, the, the data that's coming in about people, and, and seeking to reach that person before they become too aggressive or use excessive uh, force. Um, so kind of taking a proactive approach to, to dealing with uh, your, your officers. You've done this work on implicit bias. Can you talk about that and how it relates to what we're talking about today in terms of how do you, you're, 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 we've all, they've talked a lot about politics, but I think part of it, the reason we wanted you on this panel is you've done a lot of academic research about implicit bias, bias people don't necessarily know they have. How does that fit into this? Right, so I've uh, not necessarily wrote on these yeah. issues, but it has, it's something that I have been investigating. Um, so it, it is really difficult to grow up in this society without having some biases, it, 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 really. I mean, we could all sit up here and act like we don't have biases, but most of us do. But how many of us are aware of those biases? And if you're aware of them, how many of you actively seek to alter your behavior, right? So what I argue, and, and what other scholars have argued, I should say, is that um, it is difficult sometimes for people to become really aware of their own biases unless they really participate in some real self-reflection. And so like I said earlier, we all come to any situation with our past experiences, our worldviews, our core values and beliefs, and we bring that, again, to every decision that we make, um, such that whether or not if you're aware of your biases, that can influence how you interact with people, right? It can influence how you, with judgments you make about people that you interact with. And so when we talk about the police, um, I think it's really important for us, as we've been kind of harping at today, it's really important for police departments to really take note that this is something that not only impacts the rights of people, um, but it also degrades the policing process. If you're focusing more attention on some, you're ignoring, potentially ignoring others, right? Other crimes that are being committed. Um, and I wish I could cite this study right now, but I can't. But there has been work that has been done has actually shown that when you focus more on just um, profiling, that you are ignoring um, a large segment of the population that's actually engaging in criminal behavior. So, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Question. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Uh, last question, and we'll move to the audience after this. Um, Monica expresses optimism about Republicans and Democrats working together that I, I cover politics. I do not share this optimism on any issue, particularly this one. But I want to ask a broader question, which Rashad, we're talking about federal action. If you may, and he knows this, Congress not passing a lot of bills that the president wants to sign. States have a lot of these same, a lot of the states have these same kinds of things. And also what I've seen, what I at least, what I feel like right now is the, the, the movement right now cons is consisting a lot of black and brown and white liberals, and therefore um, Bill de Blasio found this problem of, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consensus in New York, a fairly liberal place. He was not able to find a lot of, he got criticized very sharply for, what I, for making comments that I thought were not terribly controversial. So is there an idea or a theory here about how you take whatever ideas about police reform you have and make sure that they don't become the latest part of our partisan divide in America where because we already know that President Obama and Eric Holder are on one side, which makes the other side think they should be opposed to these things. So how do you take these issues and turn off the sort of depoliticize them? Is that possible? And how do you do that? Rashad, I think you've thought about this a lot, is my guess. So. Yeah. So two weeks ago, I, um, I um, testified in front of the President's Commission um, for, on 21st Century Policing, uh, which is the sort of recent commission they've developed with a host of experts. Um, and Everything that I presented on, from, on behalf of Color of Change members were things that can be done by the Justice Department. Right? They are not things that need Congress at this point. And we'll come back to the No, 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 no but, 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 but I, will get to, okay. I will get to that. So there's also, there is also this specter of, of right and left coming together around a certain set of issues. I've actually been in a number of meetings over the past, um, or a couple of meetings over the past six months where like first time I go into a criminal justice meeting and I'm the only black person in the room and um, making sure I'm in the right meeting on the right side <laughs> um, and like a little concern like am I getting set up um, and, um, and in the room with sometimes people that 
my organization has caused a lot of trouble for through our campaign work. Um, and, um, and so I say that to say, I say that to say that, that you know, there's a, there's a, a, um, a piece of the right, the right w uh, of evangelicals, of libertarians who are looking at the budget and, um, and who, who are looking at potential collaborations. And there are going to be sort of a number of bills at the federal level. Um, I don't necessarily know how much faith I have in how far they're going to go, or even how much damage some of it may do, you know, how many things that the compromise might be and how, how painful that might be to this, to this moment. You know, all that to say, um, you know, I certainly don't think that anyone doing this work in this moment thinks that victory or progress is going to be easy. And in order for us to sort of build the powerful movement necessary to actually get any politician to sort of come on our side on this issue, we have to build an agenda that forces political leaders to come to us on this issue. And that's going to have to not just rely simply on coronating anyone on the left or the right politically in this upcoming primary season, but sort of leveraging this moment of people being activated and in engaged and building the type of platform that forces people to have to take on some of these issues. Because like I said in my opening around the difference between 23 years ago with that Rodney King videotape having to go through multiple channels before it reached the marketplace and today is that these issues simply are not going to go away. We are not in the same type of media space where um, corporate media has to validate these issues coming forward or corporate media can say well we covered three of those issues last week we're not going to cover they're going to continue to happen they're going to continue to be amplified and community is going to continue to be mobilized and those in power are going to continue to be made uncomfortable until we start making some progress on these issues so politicians are never our leaders or our advocates on these issues they always have to be pushed they always have to be challenged. They always have to be made to feel uncomfortable, and that's what movement building's about. Let me get civic here, because you, you laid out something that I think you, so your, your idea essentially is we're gonna, you're gonna have a bunch of ideas on policing that you ask Hillary Clinton, Rand Paul, Jeb Bush to endorse or not, is that what you're sort of, is that what you're previewing for me? Well, yes, we're, yeah, we're gonna have a number of things, and I actually believe that what we're already seeing from the Justice Department is a number of things being put in place now. We're seeing changes being made. We're seeing a commission that will, hopefully implement some things. They're certainly not going to implement everything that we want at Color of Change. The fact of the matter is, is the goal then is to defend and fight for the things that get implemented that we care about and force the candidates to have to talk about a set of issues, that we have to force this conversation, this debate. And yes, I see there's going to be differences and disagreement. We already see it on the Republican side. There's going to be one candidate on the Republican side that's going to probably be saying some things that are going to probably make some Democrats uncomfortable. And there's going to be some real disagreement on the, Demo on the Democratic side around this. And this is the moment, I think, for those who are doing movement building to have to really sort of make some decisions about who do we support, who do we fight against, who do we make uncomfortable, and, and, and how do we turn this movement into the type of movement that like got us health care, that got us some of the things that like the repeal to don't ask, don't tell, that got us some of the things where we make those in power uncomfortable and force them to have to see this moment of cultural presence for the cultural power that exists. Let me ask you all two questions, three of you. So two questions based on who you said. Do you all agree that it's a federal issue or do some of you all think it should be done at the local and the state level one? And then the second question about how do you avoid this becoming or make this less partisan too? So. Who wants to start? I mean, I, I don't disagree with the with this federal strategy. I mean, it's like Rashad said. I mean, historically, it's one that has been applied on you know, uh, civil rights, economic civil accommodations, rights. voting rights. You know, uh, certainly the statement about the um, leaving things in the hands of power in the hands of local government um, being never good for Black folks is you know pretty consistently you could prove that. Um, unfortunately, you know. Um, you know, we, we might need a constitutional amendment to really <laughs> give the federal government the kind of power we wanted to have over policing. So I, um, I think it's a both and situation. You know, there's, um, I think there are a lot of things that have to be done at the local level to rein police in. And uh, federal requirements is one strategy to get us there. But I think uh, we have to capitalize on a lot of this energy that's going on in the country right now and get it behind local campaigns. Um, we need to create some models figure out what's working at the local level uh, while we're pushing at the federal level. Um, I think a lot of the, you know, one thing is, you know, it's hard for the federal government to set a standard if there aren't so 
some places that are trying different things and they're being shown to work. So local wins are, will be crucial to getting to that point, I believe. Um, not that they haven't already happened. Like I think one of the things that's left out of these conversations a lot of times is there are decades worth of work being done by people in communities that have led to local victories. Some of them we've lost also, like Rashad has, has, has talked about. So um, you know, I, I think it's a both and in terms of local and kind of federal strategies. Was that another part of the question? Uh, how do you make the issues less partisan? Oh, I don't think they're partisan. Um, I don't think that there's a real dichotomy between Republicans and Democrats on mass incarceration, on militarization. Um, I think they're, they're, you, they're typically aligned, I think, a lot of the times. I think um, the Obama administration is, you know, um, somewhat better, I think, than a lot of Democrats. I mean, look at Missouri, you know, who was the governor in Missouri, you know, how many, how many things that, that Jay Nixon just totally screw up um, around Ferguson, you know, I mean, not only that, but, you know, letting the, situ letting the conditions foster um, in these places. Um, it's, I, don't, I don't believe it's partisan at all. If you look at, you know, um, the last Democratic president before Obama, Clinton, you know, we saw um, a ton of federal spending on police, putting police in schools in the wake of things like Columbine and the drug war. Um, so I don't see it as, as, as partisan. I think, just, I was just in to say Rashad's exactly right, we got to pressure both sides Equally, we can't let um, Democrats off the hook because we're typically with them. Um, I don't think this is a situation where we'll find that. And I think the, one of the biggest problems is the police lobby <laughs> is incredibly powerful. Um, they have a lot of power, uh, both in money and but by the position that they fill in our society, they have a lot of leverage on people in power. Um, so that's what you're really up against, you know, um, is folks who don't want to see that change. And then, then politicians, also because of the you know, cultural things we have where we, we view police as equal to safety in a lot of situations, police are very um, timid in taking, I mean, politicians are very timid in taking on police. So I think it's all about pushing, making it so uncomfortable. Even, you know, when, the, when folks came out with the shut it down strategies, that was intentional, saying we've got to make things to the point where it's so uncomfortable for people that we have to deal with this situation because if we're waiting for a political will from either party, I just don't think it's there. Professor Monica, do you have anything else to add? Um, I just want to clarify that I don't imagine a coming bipartisan nirvana happening on the federal <laughs> level, but, uh, <laughs> but I do think there's an appetite um, in states, and especially in conservative, or e including in conservative states, for reducing their prison right. budget. Um, and so I think that that's where you'll see a lot of actual kind of demand and, and maybe local action on sort of the things that they have discretion over, like who they decide to arrest people, you know, I mean, who they decide to arrest and what for. So there's, there's some a little bit coming maybe of that. Uh, I wouldn't add anything um, new. I think we're ready for some questions. Somebody in the front. Um, do I just introduce yeah. Hi, my name is Saif. Um, I'm a 3L at uh, American University, Washington College of Law. Um, I had two quick points and questions, uh, one directed to Scott. Um, you talked about community policing and how that was important. Um, now my thought about that is, although it's a great idea, the knife, cut, uh, the knife cuts both ways. So if you have um, colored communities policing themselves, you're also gonna have white communities doing the same thing and that's, that's where you got um, Trayvon Martin type cases where it was the neighborhood watch. It was just somebody uh, policing their own community. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And the second point was, um, I'm also writing in a paper on implicit racial bias um, and, the, and the judicial aspect of it. Um, but my thought is, um, you suggested training to police uh, regarding implicit racial bias. And there's many jurisdictions that currently do that. For example, um, LA um, has that in place right now. But I don't think that's enough. So it's, what would be your ideas from transcending the classroom into actual practice? It's one thing to learn it, it's another thing to actually practice it, and how would you do that? So um, that's an that's a interesting perspective on it. I think, um, just to clarify, and I know you're not saying this, but I just want to clarify. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that we have armed vigilantes in communities pe peeking out their window, sitting in their car, you know, or that we, you know, that's, that's not the alternative to policing that I'm talking about. Um, the, um, what I'm talking about is how do we deal with kind of the lower level things that are happening in our communities and um, 
give folks with skills, right? Not just, you know, a, a neighborhood watch is not to me an alternative, you know, an alternative is a group of folks who've been trained up on conflict resolution, for instance, right? If there's a incident going on down the street, you know, you you call a number to the to the to someone who's a peacekeeper as opposed to the police, right? Um, if they had that in a white community, that sounds okay to me. I think, of course, in every community, just like with the police, we're going to have a lot of things that Terry's talking about, about implicit bias coming out, you know, do I worry about a white guy resolving a conflict between people of different races? Also worry about a black guy doing it, but I especially worry about a police officer doing it, mainly because he's got a gun, and his biases then, you know, can really escalate to some real damage. He also has a power to arrest people. so you know, has real impacts on people's lives. So those are the types of things that I'm talking about. I think, you know, we, um, we got to deal with vigilantism uh, and whatnot as well. But, you know, when, I, when we're talking about alternatives, those, those are the types of things I'm talking about. But I think, and just, just to the point about the resources again. So we're not, um, we're not saying just pull police out of the communities, let the community figure it out, right? We're saying invest in the communities and programs uh, and structures and communities that help to deal with some of these issues um, uh, like addiction, like, beefs, local community beefs, if you will, you know, things like that, um, as opposed to dealing with, with police. Uh, that's a good question. I, I think what you're getting at is how do you get people to really, um, truly buy in to the training, basically. So you can be forced to do something and you do it because you got to check that box, right? Or you could really, um, really take it on as a personal challenge. And I think what will generate that is um, having more and more open dialogues about race, about bias, and having people, not just the police, but people in general, really thinking about these issues. And I think it is possible to see a shift in cultural changes around um, how people view each other. Um, I just turned 60, so forgive me. The organization that's famous for st um, propagating stand your ground laws all over the country? Alec. Alec. <laughs> that's wishful thinking. Is there a progressive <laughs> Alec that is getting into the hands of local, and this is, would be a great job for the Advancement Project, getting um, applications, good proposal, funding proposals, and legislation into local? And, and, and the other quick question is, anyone trying to get prisoners voting rights? Because I think that would change the ball game. I think you all are working on both these issues, right? Yeah, so <laughs> definitely on the second one uh, we've been working oh, on. Um, yeah, people are working on that as well. I think um, the, and there are like a couple states where folks currently incarcerated people can vote, at least, yeah, or at least Vermont one. I, yeah. Vermont and Utah. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but there, there's definitely folks working on that and, and a ton of folks who are working on getting folks once they've gotten out, um, getting their rights restored. Um, in terms of the um, progressive ALEC or racial justice ALEC or whatever, I think um, what ALEC has done is a couple things. They have cre developed model legislation and, pr and promoted it through conservative um, circles and they've worked really closely with legislators. And I think um, there's definitely some work right now of folks trying to collect those kind of legislative models at local um, and state levels. And obviously, there's a lot of federal demands. Go ahead. Well, yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's been, a, over the course of the last 20 years, there's been a number of different versions of the progressive, um, of the progressive ALEC, from the Progressive States Network to um, a Progressive Policy Network. There have been a number of groups that have been around for five or ten years and have went away. The, the challenge with ALEC, and, and Color of Change has a deep relationship with ALEC, um, um, is that ALEC you know, gets its money from corporations and they're pushing corporate policy. So Stand Your Ground Law was actually part of the funding strategy that ALEC had with the NRA and Walmart. Walmart was the largest, is the largest seller of guns. So they were pushing Stand Your Ground to sell more guns. And, um, and so, Part of the progressive side of that is that you'd actually have to find the right funding model that didn't rely on like, you know, um, that did, you know you're not going to get, you oftentimes don't have the same type of 
corporate connections for a lot of the progressive policies we're trying to push. Um, and so the challenge for a lot of the progressive versions of ALEC over the years has largely been that funding question of, so yes, you can put together a packet of model legislation on a wide range of things that progressives care about, but then you actually have to fund getting state legislators the training and all that to get it out there, and that has been a challenge. I would note just the Washington Post an article a few days ago that I think um, the NAACP is working in 13 different states on, at least 13 different states on different ideas to change policing in the state legislature. Because then, so there is movement on these issues already in states from people who want to see changes of police practices. Yes, I'm, I'm Ralph Eubanks. I'm, I'm curious about the, the change in the policies at the federal level that you are all talking about and wondering how you actually think those will um, be enforced at state and local levels. Because one of the things that comes to mind for me is just thinking about, this is a completely different situation, but the resistance right now, Judge Moore in Alabama, to actually enacting something that is a federal policy. And I wonder if you think you might see similar resistance to these type of policies coming from the federal level and going down to the local level. Absolutely, I think there'll absolutely be resistance, but you actually have to have something for someone to resist, to, 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 to start down that road, right? And then we're actually talking about Judge Moore now and having this conversation because he's actually resisting a federal policy. Without it, right, you don't have that. And, and there's been a number of states, right, where the idea of marriage equality ever existing, let alone existing now through the courts, seemed like you know, a far off dream. And so Alabama may be the one place, but you've seen this enacted over and over again in a number of states where couples have gotten married um, and have been getting married. And so to the extent that, yes, we're seeing some back and forth with Judge Moore and him not doing this, I think history tells us that Judge Moore is going to lose this fight. Um, like he's going to lose this fight. He's going to go down. This is like, you know, I guess, you know, his biography moment. Um, but, um, but we, and so that is, but that is my whole point around getting federal policies because there is such resistance that with, there is such resistance to some of the things that are pushing that without that, we don't even have the teeth to battle the Judge Moores of the world on our issue. Hi, I wanted to ask a question about movement building, specifically regarding um, have you guys seen a rise in the number of allies, whether it be um, criminal justice issues like policing or prison related to, for example, mental health. Like, ha has there been a rise in organizations coming out to really um, participate in movement building like across um, different, I guess, different organizations? Um, and then the second question was kind of about um, not to imply that there won't be federal reform or state reform, but are there other options that citizens can invest in reforms that don't have to do with legislation that, that we should be thinking about and saying, okay, this is the way I can participate? I can take the second question. Um, I think having federal reforms is important, but again, policing is a local thing. Uh, such that local police departments can apply for funding, but they, they don't have to. Right? So I think it is important for people at the local level to really push these issues within their jurisdictions for their mayors, who the police chiefs ultimately um, have to respond to, for them to push change within their police departments. Um, let's, let's, Scott, yes, Scott. Well, I was just really quick to that. I think it just, what we're really talking about is targets. Who are the people who have the power to make some of these changes and even beyond the mayors, I think police chiefs themselves are, are big targets. They have a lot of discretion in terms of the way that their departments are going to implement policies or going to do the work of policing. The so body cameras are yeah. spreading based on police departments themselves saying we're going to try this, right? right. This and ultimately, one. you know, in order to maintain their positions, you know, they, um, I don't, I wouldn't say they need public support. But they, they, but if they don't have public support, they need to fly under the radar. Right. So if, they, if you make their life <laughs> hard enough, a lot of times they might be responsive as well. Um, so I think out of, outside of elected officials, those are some of the folks with, with some kind of influence. And they but. do rely on public support, but ultimately the police chief is selected by the mayor. Right. Mm -hmm. So if the mayor, if, if people are putting pressure on the mayor, then the police, chief, uh, the mayor for sure is going to put pressure on the police chief. And I think that that's why the movement building is so important. I mean, we've seen 
um, you know, in the, just in the aftermath of, of, the, um, of Michael Brown's death and then the, after, and then the aftermath of the, of the non-indictment, um, the number of sort of progressive allies who don't necessarily work on criminal justice every day taking the Color of Change petition and making it their own. Um, and sending that out to their list and building engagement from members um, has been um, tremendous. You know, we delivered nearly a million um, signatures to the White House um, from a, co a broad coalition of progressive groups who wanted to stand on this issue. And then just to answer the second question, you know, later this year we're going to be um, really continuing to build out our presence in Hollywood. We've been doing a lot of work. Um, in Hollywood in writers rooms and challenging scripted and reality television particularly around the images that it presents you know we led a campaign two years ago to get cops um, off the air at Fox and we won and they have not been they have not produced any more episodes of after 25 years the sort of first reality show which was cops which was the the um, glorified look at the war on drugs and its impact on black and brown and poor white communities. And, um, and from, from that strategy as well, the outside of the legislative strategy, the cultural strategy, because I, while I want federal and state and local policies, that's actually not going to stop people from killing us. And, um, and so we also need cultural strategies as well. And so that is definitely part of our advocacy efforts. And, you know, you can go to colorofchange.org um, and find out more about sort of our represent, our media justice work, which I think is really an important lever in all of this. More questions? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Joshua Serrano. Uh, I'm an intern at the Institute for Policy Studies up the street here. But I'm, I'm born and raised in Brownsville, New York. I, Brownsville, Brooklyn. I heard that thrown around a few times today. Um, so... I guess mine is sort of a comment question is to see how you guys feel about it, right? Um, because I, I like a lot of the things I heard today about different uh, approaches from the federal level and uh, different things that can happen locally, right? But uh, what I am consistently seeing with this issue of mass incarceration is that uh, the existence of mass incarceration in America is actually... Um, I don't know what it does to black people in this in the in this country at this time. It's something that America does to black people in general with uh, throughout all of its history, which is to take those lives, chew them up, and spit them out, right? And so, I mean, I don't know. I just think about things when we talk about this, right? As like you know, today there's more people under federal under uh, under supervision under criminal supervision in jails and in federal prisons than there was, more African Americans than there was at the height of the slave trade, you know? And so this is a, obviously a very, very important racial justice issue. And so as a young aspiring activist, how important do you think it is to use race as the central rallying, I guess, the thing that galvanizes people to get behind this issue, instead of talking about maybe the fiscal constraints of uh, imprisoning so many people or what we can lobby our elected officials to do. You know what I mean? What, how do you feel about using this as the 21st century civil rights issue? Go ahead. I, I, I think in some ways it is being used that way, um, but I think in order to get more people to move on the issue or to, in order to move it from a concept uh, or, I don't know how to phrase this correctly, but I know what I'm feeling. Um, in order to move it from something that we want to something that's actually going to happen, you have to come about it from a variety of different angles, right? So you're going to have to bring in those people who maybe you don't talk about race so much, but you talk about citizenship. Maybe instead of um, just focusing in on the issue of police bias, we focus on police bias and police practices. So I think it's a matter of, of addressing the issues from a variety of different um, ways to really get at the heart of what we really want to accomplish. Well, I think you use race, because actually race is woven all through this, right? 
And as you pointed, there, if you look at American history, um, you know, there's a lot of history behind how blacks have been oppressed in this country, right? But moving from that to actually pushing policy, there are some people who aren't going to want to hear all that history, but yet you could still move them to move in the right direction to change policy. You understand what I'm saying? I, I don't think this is a question of using race or not. You can't avoid race on this issue. And right. so we can't organize or build campaigns where we pretend race is not a fundamental piece of what's happening here because it's in the room. It's like having like a big elephant in the back of the room and then pretending like the elephant's not here and us just trying to continue this panel and like the elephant's making noise back there. Mm -hmm. Race is in the room, it is clear, and, and, it, and, it, and, it has, and it's an animating force in, in so many of the ways that people are dealing with the criminal justice system. That said, this country has 3% of the world's population and incarcerates about 25% of the world's population, 25% of the world's incarcerated population. So for instance, um, a, white, a white man um, today is three-fourths as likely to be incarcerated as a black person, a black man at the height of apartheid in South Africa. So if white privilege gets you a three-fourths discount, right, on being, um, you know, you know, uh, not being in South Africa. Like, if that's what white privilege does in this country, we have the ability to also build real support and real allyship with 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 white folks in many states around this country who are seeing their incarceration rates go sky high. So it's not about avoiding race or pretending it's not happening or not even having it at the center of so much of the campaigns and the work that we're trying to do here, but talking about a larger system, a larger caste system, racial caste system in this country that's led us to a set of policies that are not just hurting black communities anymore, but are hurting all of us. And helping people see themselves inside of a black struggle for equality where they can see how their own communities are being hurt as well. And I think that that's gonna be the way that we sort of build a type of movement where many people can see themselves inside of it while they're simultaneously supporting and building allyship for people who don't look like them. Couple more questions. Hello, my name is uh, Nicholas Lewis, and I'm an intern at the American Civil Liberties Union here in, in Washington, D.C. Um, I Just a quick question. Um, do you feel that segregation and the history of segregation in this country actually allowed um, the ideas of racism and the layers that are, all, that are involved um, concerning uh, race and validity, validity of um, um, the socioeconomic issue that's happening here um, in America, do you feel that segregation is basically the spark of all of this issue? I think segregation helps to um, intensify it because communities aren't interacting with each other. But, you know, this country was really founded on racist principles. So, you know, let's not act like that that's not reality. Um, and to really get into this, it would take me like 20 minutes to really explain this. But I, I, I think you know what I'm saying. Um, I, just to answer your question, I think segregation intensifies the differences. Um, um, uh, but it's not as simple as that. Go ahead. Sure. You know, on, I think the first thing to remember is the most integrated period of American history was also probably the most stark race <laughs> racist period, that's slavery, right? We were all living on the same plots and everything during that period. And um, we, <laughs> but ag agreed, it, it, it um, segregation has, has uh, worse, maybe not worsened, but it, um, it creates new avenues of, of issues. So um, the biases that we've been talking about that police hold often, um, I, I think, you know, if, if we were less segregated, if people had more interactions with people of different backgrounds, I think you can break down a lot of those. A lot of those biases are formed based on media representations, type of mm -hmm. things that Rashad and his team are, are fighting against. Um, and, and I think the other thing that segregation has done it is has cordoned off, you know, um, access to the economic promise of America. So, you know, when you're going to segregated schools that are less, and I mean both pre and post Brown versus Board, right? Like, you know, de facto um, segregation like we have now, um, you have less opportunities in communities. You have, then you have less empowered communities, communities that can be, again, targeted by police who need to up their drug arrests, 
or need to write enough tickets to um, meet the budget shortfalls for the for the small town of Ferguson or somewhere like that. So, um, you know, segregation definitely plays a role. And then, of course, when you're segregated, it's very easily to just target a community, right? <laughs> like, how how are we going? I know there's there was one small municipality. You may remember this was shot in in St. Louis County where they were having Black Day. Um, this was not Ferguson. It was what's, what was the name of this place? I can't remember. Um, but it, um, they would have Black Day where the the one of the officers would. One of the leadership of the police department was like, we're going to fill up the jails with black folks today. And they would just go out and do it. How do you do that? Well, they all live in the same neighborhoods. You just go there, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, segregation definitely, you know, inflames it. Yeah. Let's get a couple more and then we'll, yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> okay. Sounds okay, I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. My name is Tony Whitehead. I am retired. Uh, and Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at the University of Maryland. And actually, I came to this event today because uh, I'm organizing an event that I refer to as the African American Incarceration Epidemic. And I use those terminologies to, to really deal with the fact of the vicious cycle of uh, incarceration failed reentry, reincarceration, and also the impact that it has not just on the individuals, but on families and black communities. In other words, the survival of a people. And so I came because I wanted to hear the panel. I was very impressed with the panel. I liked the talk about systems, the fact that you address these issues at the uh, national, the local, uh, and the individual level. I, and, and also the issues of only talking about race, confrontational for movement, but I also want to emphasize the issue of dialogue for values, the whole issue, uh, because a lot of times when you are confrontational, or you don't even have to be, I talk about dialogue a lot, but some of my white colleagues still think I only talk about race and will even admit to me that I frightened them. But there are others who I can talk to, and they will say, Tony, I never thought about this. Let's work together and move it forward. So I, I appreciate this, and, and I want to uh, get in touch with you guys later to see if any of you would like to come to my event at the end of April. Thank you. Can I say something? Of course. Um, First off, I've read your work and you've done some phenomenal um, work in your field. Um, and he actually could be on the panel. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the point you mentioned about values is one way that you can cross the divide between Republicans and Democrats. Because really what we're talking about are upholding American values of equality, right? Right. Can I just make one more quick uh, uh, I became aware of my own, uh, own values because I grew up as a sharecropper in the segregated South, multi-generational, and I wrote a piece in which I talked about I didn't know I was black until I went to Turkey as a Peace Corps volunteer in 65. I would still use the word Negro. I, didn't, I had to go to Turkey to discover that I was an American because of segregation. Uh, and they helped me with those things. And the thing about American, realizing that I had values that uh, we in America had. For example, the unconscious value of using your time productively. Turks ran me crazy <laughs> because they put a lot of time in social relationships rather than making money. But that, that put me in touch with my own values. Get our last one. So there are some sub studies that have put support for police at as high as 80% and kind of thinking of that alongside uh, structural racism and implicit racism, what do you do in communities where this type of policing may not even be seen as a bug but in fact a feature? That's a really good question. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think what you're asking is how do you get buy-in from communities where this doesn't seem to be an issue. I think again getting back, potentially getting back to the whole issue of values. Um, if we say that we are a country that values um, equality, um, we have to really mean it. 
and it doesn't matter whether or not if you personally are being impacted by this issue, um, don't you think that everybody should be treated equally? Um, it's the same thing with the right to marriage issue, right? Um, if you think that everyone should be treated equally, whether or not if you are, uh, are gay or lesbian, you should su potentially support the issue because of the notion of equality. Anybody else? Well, I would just say that it's really important not to leave everything up to popular will. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I think that um, it's one of the things that people have been talking about as far as federal incentives, a lot of that is setting standards and putting money behind it so that <laughs> you know, it, it removes from the process a lot of these kinds of problems. Yeah. I think that's kind of the issue that he's raising is also you know, how do we get to the point where we can win federal, you know, um, those kind of policy changes if we can't mobilize those kind of communities which you know make up the majority of the country and hold a lot of political power and I th you know for me I think it is this is a really tough question it's like the question maybe um, the I think these communities do have to be confronted with what's happening consistently I think you know everyone is talking about the Selma movie right that that moment on the bridge where folks um, were confronted with what the reality of the country was, even though it wasn't their personal reality, sparked a lot of people to be talking about it to action. I think you know some um, some maybe oversimplified in the movie, but that's another discussion. But you know, similar to I think the videos of the killings, especially I think the Eric Garner video was really triggered. I mean, I saw people literally go from defending Darren Wilson to once they saw the Eric Garner video saying, oh, maybe there is a problem, you know, just like some of that and then the, like, even confronting like on the cultural stuff like Rashad was talking about, whatever. I think that people can hold two simultaneous things. They can support police and realize that good police need to have the system reformed as well because good police are getting painted with a broad brush for, for the fact that there isn't type of count accountability that roots out bad policing. And when I, when I testified at the President's Commission a couple of weeks ago, and I was on a panel, there was four of us on the panel, the opening panel, and the other three folks were law enforcement. They were like, you know, um, you know 30 plus years in the law enforcement business, and then, um, and then me. And then, um, and what I will say is that, um, you know, one of them did not want any type of reform um, whatsoever. Um, the head of the, the, the unions, um, the national um, police unions, you know, talked about that basically what needed to happen is actually um, greater level of latitude for police. Mm -hmm. um, and the other two folks though, and one being a police chief of a, of a, of a medium-sized city, talked about a set of reforms that will be helpful to him. Some things that actually do need to happen that if they're put in place at the federal level, that would help him. And so to the extent that I do think that we are in this moment that is complicated for all of us in this country and it's complicated for local communities. I just urge all of us to be able to hold many different things. That just because we want to um, reform policing in this country, just because we want to sort of put some accountability in place, doesn't mean that we don't support police. And it doesn't mean that we can't simultaneously support police. It means though, it means though that in order for us to be able to move forward in our communities, for everyone to feel safe, the current system just won't do, and that needs to be reformed. We'll end it there. Um, thank you all for coming. Let's give an applause for our panelists who are excellent.